Thanks, Cindy. And now my pleasure to reintroduce to you Todd Stozy. Good morning. Feels like I was just here. Everybody well rested? And I will, as I drop things up here, give you guys props for being here this long. This is a long week of classes. I mean, these are like eight hour days. I don't know how you guys are doing it. So kudos to you for sticking through all this stuff. And I'll start this out. This talk I'm going to talk about today is very different from what I've talked about the last two days. This particular talk today is about a program that we offer within Santa Cruz County called Planned Pethood. Um, do you guys have Planned Parenthood here? Yes, okay. Well, Planned Parenthood's an organization in the States uh, which offers um, medical care to women, um, including abortions, including um, you know, basic medical care, things like that. So we kind of created this, this program and called it Planned Pethood as a kind of pun on that particular um, uh, organization. So really what it is is it's spay and neuter for every single person in our county. Every single person in our county, whether they make a million dollars, whether they make one dollar a year, everybody gets low cost spay and neuter in our community. And by doing so, um, we're able to offer free spay and neuter services to people who truly can't afford it. And I'm gonna talk to you about that today, how we do that, and how you can bring this back to your community and make a ton of money. Um, you know, we started this program a few years back and at this point we're making over $100,000 a year in direct revenue, not including dog licensing, just direct revenue from this program um, that we're using then to use for other programs. So your community, um, whether you're in a rural or urban community, whether you're in a community that's high income or very poverty stricken, underserved, whether you're living in a community that's black, white, Latino, whatever it is, whether your community's older, whether you're younger, or it's a college town, no matter what it is, or even if it's some sort of statistically measured demographic from some super smart college professor who's figured out some sort of chart of something about your community, Wherever you live, it doesn't matter. Everybody needs low-cost spay and neuter. Every single community needs low-cost spay and neuter for their residents to prevent animals coming into the shelter and to prevent euthanasia. Because communities need spay and neuter services. And for the policymakers out there, you're gonna save money in the long run and make money in the long run by doing spay and neuter services for your community. Because they save lives, spay and neutering save lives. It decreases impound numbers. And I'm probably just repeating myself from the past couple days as well, but it's important, so I just can constantly repeat myself. It lowers nuisance behaviors. Those barking dog complaints that you get nonstop all day long, a lot of it can be resolved with spaying and neutering that animal. A lot of the running at large animals you have running loose in your community can be lowered by um, spaying and neutering. Lessens the chance of certain medical issues, but the most important part is it saves taxpayer money. By spaying and neutering animals in the front run, by being proactive and getting animals in your community spayed and neutered, you're saving taxpayer money by saving resources from having to respond to nuisance dog complaints, having to intake animals, you know, newborn kittens, newborn puppies. Um, you're, you're really saving taxpayer money over the long run by proactively addressing spay and neuter. And one way we've done this in, in my particular department to really get people jazzed on getting spay and neuter off, you know, getting spay and neuter done is is most folks know that police officers uh, really have this thing when they go into work, they wanna get guns off the street. You know, yeah, I got another gun off the street. At least in the States, that's how it is. Yeah, I got a gun off. Like that's, that's how they measure their success for the day. So my officers, what we've started doing is we look at how many balls and ovaries we can get off the street in a day. <laughs> so we have a, a, a wipe off board in our department where officers go out and when we get someone convinced to do spay and neuter, we put up a little check on it. So, you know, we get, we get, you know, okay, we've got six balls off the street today and we put that up. Okay, we got an ovary off the street, we're gonna put that up. And the winner at the end of the month gets a prize. So it really kind of gets people jazzed, like, you know what, this is fun, I'm getting this off the street and I'm gonna get some sort of prize at the end of the month. So, um, and when I first started the, the doing that for my officers, I kind of would just give them like a $5 gift certificate to Starbucks or something like that. And now they're like, dude, we're getting so many balls off the street, we want something more. So now I'm spending a lot more money on this stuff, but it's working and it's, you know, a little money out of my pocket to kind of, you know, one, keep my staff happy and two, effectively work with my community. So the reality in our communities is that spay and neuter services are often expensive. Um, I can't count the number of people I talk to, you know, I'll, I'll talk to them like, hey, you know, your animal needs to be spayed or neutered, and they'll say, oh, I have a, an appointment scheduled next week, it's $500 though, can you believe that? And it's like, wow, 500 bucks for a spay and neuter, that's just, that's absurd. You know, there's no reason for a spay and neuter to be that expensive, but that's the reality in our communities, that veterinarians, not all of them, but there, there's a lot of veterinarians that are 
looking to make money, and this is one way they can make a lot of money is by doing spay and neuter services. The animal care deserts that uh, Betsy talks about, those communities where there's areas of our communities where there's no pet food stores, there's no vet clinics, there's no um, resources for people to understand animal ownership, where people don't have a place to go to get information on these things, and that exists in our communities. Every single community out there has animal care deserts, and unfortunately, those animal care deserts are often in the most underserved communities. Um, you know, that you go to an area where there's a, a high income area, and there's gonna be pet store after pet store after pet store, you go into the underserved community and you won't find one. Um, and, and it's just the reality that's out there. And a lot of times, a lot of uh, problems in our communities is that the government doesn't offer public spay and neuter. Um, we didn't, our agency didn't for years, and we started a couple years back, and um, I'll show you stats at the end of this, how that's really increased, um, um, or lowered, I should say, our euthanasia numbers and increased um, um, our, out, our live release outcome. And the best thing, uh, or I should say the worst thing, about these realities in our communities is that it increases taxes. It increases those taxes and, you know, because you have to spend more to deal with these issues. You have to spend more to deal with going to nuisance animal complaints, deal, spend more to care for the animals that come into your shelter. So by having these realities that are currently out there, we're spending a lot of money we don't need to be spending. So how do we extend services to all of our residents? How do we offer low cost or free spay and neuter services to all of our residents? And there's, there's been ways that we've done this over the years, some that work and some that don't. And one of the ones that I think a lot of communities use are the low cost free spay and neuter services. They, they just wanna offer everybody low cost or offer just underserved people low cost or just offer free. And they just kind of go about it and a lot of times it doesn't work. And it doesn't work because it's not sustainable. Um, it's not sustainable just to try and fix everything out there without a long-term plan of how you're gonna to continue to fund that. Um, because the problem with lower free services is really how do you determine who qualifies? How do you determine, okay, this person can get a free spay and neuter and this person can't? How do you determine that when that's, and this is what I'm talking about when this is all you have. If you're an agency that only provides free spay and neuter to certain people, how do you decide who truly gets that free spay and neuter services and who has to go pay for that $500 one? Who's subsidizing those services? So if you're offering free spay and neuter services to someone, who's actually subsidizing the cost for that? And is the funding being replenished? And that's a big one. So when you're subsidizing, say you have a thousand or a hundred thousand dollars to do spay and neuter services, and you're excited and you go out there and you do 400 surgeries and you're all jazzed and you're great, at the end of those 400 surgeries, you don't have any more money and you're not doing any more surgeries. So you've only really been effective for that particular year, that particular time you've done those surgeries. And who's performing the surgery? Are you outsourcing to a veterinarian in your community? Do you have someone on staff? Who's performing that surgery and are you gonna have to pay them with that money you have to keep going? More often than not, what I've seen is these lower free services are not sustainable. These services are not sustainable because the income is not being replenished back into the pot to continue to offer to more people. And I'm gonna talk about the program we do a little later on about how we continue to replenish that so that we can offer this. And I'll give you our failure. This was our failure that we did a few years back um, in Santa Cruz County. There was a large bequest that was provided to our friends group. And do you guys have friends groups here? Friends of Animal Shelters? So what a friends group is, it's a nonprofit um, that works with, along with the shelter. Um, people can donate to them, give them things, and then they'll work with the shelter to provide services, provide um, uh, products, things like that. So there was a large bequest provided to our friends group. I, you know, it was, it was around a million dollars. So we had like a million bucks, and we're like, whoa, you know, that we, and, and basically what they wanted to do with it, and it's, it's up to them how this works. So we as a government agency can't tell them what to do with the million dollars because they're their own 501c3 nonprofit. What they decided to do was give $40 vouchers to all low-income residents. So they said anyone who makes, you know, whatever the, the threshold is, I think it's $25,000 for a family of four, those folks and only those folks can get a $40 voucher. Um, and then they can get a $40 spay or neuter. And so that's what they did. And these vouchers were used at select veterinarians. They didn't use a shelter vet. They went to select veterinarians in the community, went and used these vouchers. Um, and... This was great. I mean, we'd go out there, we'd talk to people, they'd say, well, I can't afford the 500. Oh, I can afford 40, though. This is great. I'll go take care of this. I'll go do this uh, spay neuter. Some people couldn't even afford the $40. For some people, that $40 was a hardship, and even that was too much for them. But the biggest problem was after about three years, all of a sudden they said, wait a minute, that million dollars we had, we weren't replenishing that million dollars, and now we only have about $100,000 left. Uh-oh. What are we going to do? Um, 
And so they said, you know what, we're just going to offer four vouchers a month. We're just going to start at issuing four vouchers a month to people, and those people are lucky, and the rest of the people, oh well, they're just going to have to figure it out on their own. And so that was a big problem with that, and that's when we realized, well, wait a minute, you know, we need to think of something different. We need to do something different in order to help every single person in our community. So I'll talk about that in a second. So in regards to extending services to all our residents, about the low-cost free spay neuter stuff, I've kind of talked about how that didn't work in Santa Cruz. Transportation assistance is something that folks who are volunteers out here, um, you can really provide a great benefit for this sort of thing. This is something that Pets for Life really pushes. It's something I really push with my granny squad is the transportation assistance that we can provide to folks who don't have that, that possibility. Using those volunteers to drive animals to, to uh, appointments. And a lot of folks, when I first proposed this in my agency, you know, they were like, well, what about the liability? What if you know, somebody goes out, picks up a dog, they get into an accident and the dog dies? Oh my God, the county's liable. So we took it to the county council, county council looked at it, and basically people sign a, um, a, uh, a liability release that they won't sue us. Yes, they still can, but it protects us. It's that one extra protection. So don't worry about the liability. Um, especially in the states, people can sue anyone for anything. I can look at you wrong and you can sue me. Um, so, you know, don't worry about it. Sign that waiver and you're good. And they bring the, and, and so, so the volunteers really help by bringing those animals outside of the community. Someone who can't drive five miles, someone who can't drive one mile, they bring those animals to the appointment, have the animal spayed and neutered and bring that animal back. And, you know, and I'll even say this to the officers, and the officers moved because they, oh, they're there. You guys aren't there anymore. You're over there. What, and I'll, get, I'll give one of my stories from work, um, how I help someone with driving to an appointment. I was working in one of the underserved areas doing one of our proactive um, um, uh, preventative patrols driving through, and, and I saw these two cats just chilling out on a railroad track, and I'm looking at the cats, and I could see the cat's testicles hanging down. And so I'm thinking, all right, I got to, you know, th this, is, this is a bad situation. I want to add some numbers to my board and get those testicles off the street. So I'm looking at the cats trying to figure out if they're stray, if somebody owns them, just kind of what's happening. So I just park for a while, maybe 15 minutes I'm watching. All of a sudden, this woman comes staggering out from underneath uh, the railroad tracks. Um, I think she was doing drugs under the tracks. And she came out and she sees me and she's like, oh, and, you know, and she's like, puts her hands up. Like, <laughs> you know. And I was like, no, 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 don't worry, don't worry. I'm, I'm just worried about the, about the testicles. And so we started talking and she was homeless. She, was, she actually lived underneath the railroad tracks and they were her cats. And, you know, she picks them up and she suddenly is like, holy shit, this guy's going to take my cats now. So she picks the cats up and she's backing up from me. I was like, no, 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 I don't want your cats. Your cats are in great health. You're taking care of them. And I, I, was, I had a big bag of cat food in my truck, so I gave her the bag of cat food, which kind of opened up the door. And she's like, okay, this guy's not here just to take my animals. And, I was, and she's homeless, and she lived in, she's living under that track today, but I didn't know where she'd be tomorrow. So I was like, you know what, I've got to make this, i got to work this today. I've got to make sure that these animals get spayed or neutered today, because if I wait till tomorrow, she's going to be gone. So basically, I convinced her to put her cats in my truck. Um, and I, I wrote on official letterhead, and I don't know how official this was, I don't know how this would have held up, but it made her feel better. I put on one of our official letterheads, I am transporting your cats to spay neuter services, I am not taking them from you. And I signed it, and I gave it to her, and she was very excited, and she waited underneath the bridge. I brought them in, drove them into our shelter, got them spayed and neutered, and brought them back at the end of the day. Um, you know, and got them fixed, and I don't know if she was there the next day, because I didn't go back, but you know, so we basically solved that problem right then and there, as opposed to, um, just giving her a ticket and saying, you got 30 days to comply and her saying, who cares? Um, we were able to get those cats fixed. So for the officers, there's some way you can help. So another way with the transportation assistance, you know, not only can you, you personally put them in a vehicle and drive them somewhere, but bring that clinic into the neighborhood. Bring that clinic into the underserved area, as opposed to having those animal care deserts where there's all the vet clinics in the rich part of town, put, the, put a clinic, boom, straight down there in the middle of the underserved community. Um, and whether that's through a mobile vet or brick and mortar facility, um, mobile vet's probably cheaper and probably easier to move around if you have a big city. But in our community, we actually were lucky. The friends of group, <laughs> the same friends of group who lost all that money doing the spay and neuter services, somehow got a bequest of a, um, a veterinary clinic. So an old veterinary clinic was shut down and somebody gave it to them. So they gave it to us. So we now have a brick and mortar facility right smack dab right in the low income community which is fabulous, and we staff it two days a week, and I'll talk about that, but that's one big way we've been able to bring a lot more spay-neuter services into that community, because now people, you know, even if the granny squad's got 20 people to drive and they have 30 animals that need fixed, some people can now just walk the animal right across the street to this facility. So again, 
community, I'm, I'm talking about the, how we extend services to all of our residents, and we all know my community engagement philosophy. I think you've heard me curse and shout and scream up here for the past two days. So community engagement, community engagement, community engagement. That's how we bring this stuff into our communities. It's really very important. And whether that's through the door-to-door -door outreach I've talked about, whether that's through events, and um, if you were here for my, my long day presentation the very first day, um, talked a lot about the events that we have at our animal shelter, um, bringing people into the shelter. Uh, we, we have programs every uh, Valentine's Day. Do you have Valentine's Day here? Look at that. The one holiday we share in common, <laughs> Valentine's Day. So every Valentine's Day we have a program called, or an event called Meet Your Match. You know, we basically say, you know what, if you are unlucky in love with a human, come on into the animal shelter and meet your match because an animal's better anyway. An animal's not going to hog the bed. An animal's not going to eat all the cereal in the morning. You know, the animal's always going to give you unconditional love. And on the flip side, if you're coming in and you want to meet your match as an animal and somebody else is coming in to meet their match for an animal, maybe you both will meet each other and you can both walk out with animals. So, so those are some of the events that we do. You know, we do that. We do, we, I mean, we're just event crazy. Um, we're, we're always having an event at least once a month. And really the key is, is to get people into the shelter who wouldn't normally come to the shelter. You know, people who aren't thinking about the shelter, who, who mess, maybe aren't thinking about adopting an animal, but at that event we say, we have pet photography. We have a, 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 a professional photographer coming in from noon to two o'clock who's gonna take free photographs of you and your animal. Come in. And so people will come in with their animals and then they'll learn um, about the other services that we have to offer or we'll offer free um, or low-cost microchipping or free nail trimming. And anything we can do to get people into the door, we will get people into the door so that we can then have their ear and get to talk to them about what wonderful services we have. So events are great. Events really get people who wouldn't normally come in to get in there to spread the word. Um, advertising, it's huge. Um, we do a lot of advertising in, uh, we actually have a new one um, for all you folks, who, our, new, our new thing that we put on the side of all the buses. So if you come to Santa Cruz County and you see a bus, every single bus in Santa Cruz County now has pictures of chihuahuas on it. And it says, be small minded, adopt a chihuahua <laughs> with our little tagline. So because we're so full of chihuahuas, we want you to come love a chihuahua. Um, so, you know, it's, it's all about advertising, about getting it out there, um, getting in the community. And we, I, I think um, uh, it was mentioned yesterday when um, Dr. Hurley's uh, statement was read. She, d there was a thing where she said, you know, I used to work at the Santa Cruz SPCA. So my agency, I work in Santa Cruz. It's kind of funny how small the world is, and she started in Santa Cruz. But we're not the Santa Cruz SPCA. We're the Santa Cruz Animal Shelter. Santa Cruz SPCA lost the contract about 12 years ago when I started, um, and they no longer um, provide the animal control services or the sheltering services in Santa Cruz. It's our agency. So for years, when I started, people always called us the SPCA. Oh, you're the SPCA. Oh, you're the SPCA. Even as I'm walking up with it says animal services or animal shelter, they're saying, you're the SPCA. Once we started doing, and, and I'll, I'll put this all on my, my boss who started about four and a half years ago, Melanie Sobel. Um, she is a dynamo when it comes to advertising, a dynamo when it comes to um, enga you know, engaging folks with um, uh, advertising, things like that. And so in those four and a half years she's been here, and with what she's done to the, to the agency, people no longer call us the SPCA. Through her effective marketing, her effective advertising, people now know we're the animal shelter. Just by getting our logo out there and our name out there, people know who we are, and that's very important for your groups to be out there. And one of the things that we're so proud of is we're a government agency. We're government animal control officers. We're the government pound. We're the government killers of animals. That's who we are. We kill animals and we're the government. Yet, every single day when I walk around my community, I see people wearing shirts that say Santa Cruz County Animal Shelter. Because people are proud of our organization and what we do because we're effective in our marketing, effective in our advertising, um, getting the word out there and what we do. So additional things to think about in regards to spay and neuter services, grants or fundraising. Those, those are definitely good things when you're thinking about spay and neuter services. And I'll throw some plugs out here in regards to grants. ASPCA, the, and, and, and again, this is Australia, so I don't know how it works here, so hopefully I'm not misleading you, but um, ASPCA offers a lot of grants, um, some of them uh, spay and neuter targeted. PetSmart Charities is a huge one, um, especially for free roaming cats. Uh, we got a grant for $86,500. Uh, specifically for cats in our 95076 uh, area code or zip code. That's uh, the Watsonville area. So there's a lot of grants and, and money out there for that. Again, this is money that's going to run out at some point, so it's not going to be long-term sustainable. But, you know, if, if you can get free money, you might as well get free money. And then animalsheltering.org also has a lot of uh, resources and grants. And if you go to that website, there's a section with a grant page with just hundreds of grants you can look into. So 
hopefully there's some Australian specific ones. And then fundraising, I'm not even gonna get into it. Um, I don't know how to fundraise, I've never known, I've, I've never tried it. It could be a whole class by itself, but it's very important in getting money into your, sh into your shelters. Um, again, it might not be sustainable, but it's very important to help with the spay neuter services. And then finally, things to think about when you're thinking about spay neuter services in your community is utilizing private or government veterinarians. So when you're setting up these, these programs, do you utilize a private veterinarian, do you use a government veterinarian? And a lot of times, at least what I found in my work going across the country and my work in Santa Cruz specifically, is private veterinarians want to be paid by somebody. You know, so even if you have a voucher system, they're not doing it for free. They want part of that, they want some money coming into their pocket, so it might lessen the amount of spay neuters that you can do based on what money they want to take out of that voucher. It might work in a small town. If you have a very small town with one or two veterinarians and you only have 100 animals coming in a year, 100 animals in a community, it might work. That might work, but it's not sustainable. Working with private veterinarians is often not sustainable because private veterinarians have gotten into business to make money. I mean, we're humans and we want to make money, right? I mean, that's why I work for the government, I make money. So that's what we're in it. So it's often not sustainable for the long term to use a private veterinarian. Government, however, we serve our community. That is our role, that's our job. We're, we're public servants. We serve our community. And we exist in small towns and in large towns and we must be sustainable because we can't just go in and try and spay and neuter everything in one year and then say, okay, we did it for a year and we spayed and neutered 500 animals, we're done. No, you need to be sustainable and you need to continue to spay and neuter animals once you, after you retire. Your program needs to continue going. And I think I just said that, so I repeated myself. So as the government, and I know this is the big thing, where the hell does this money come from? Where do you get this money? You know, wh how do you provide these services for the long term with it being sustainable. And wouldn't it be great if we could make money while doing that? Wouldn't it be great if we could offer these spay and neuter services and also make money while doing that? Wouldn't it be great if then we could take that extra money we make and use it to spend somewhere else? Wouldn't it be great if we could take that money, spay and neuter an animal, make 50 bucks off that spay and neuter and then go buy a dog house or some other dog? Wouldn't it be great if at that point, because people are paying for the spay and neuter services, we could then give free ones to the truly underserved? And wouldn't it be great if we could help those folks in the animal care deserts? Guess what? We can, and it works. We can do this, and it works, and it doesn't just work in Santa Cruz County. Um, this works in large cities as well. This, this particular program, Planned Pethood, uh, which I mentioned was, was um, by my boss, Melanie Sobel, was started in Milwaukee. She worked, at, she worked in Milwaukee for a number of years, and she started the program there. Milwaukee, if you're unfamiliar with it, is a very large city. Um, it's not a huge city, it's not as big as New York City, but it's, but it's a large city, it's much bigger than Santa Cruz. And she started it there, and she was making money hand over fist in Milwaukee, um, you know, making a lot more than we make in Santa Cruz just based on the population that she has. So it can work in large cities, it can work in small cities. And the way Planned Parenthood works is there's really no income requirements. As I mentioned in the beginning, whether you make a million bucks a year, whether you make $20,000 a year, you, everybody can, can pay the same amount um, for a spay-neuter service so that everybody has that low-cost spay-neuter available for them um, so that everybody gets it. Now again, the way this works is those who truly can't afford the spay neuter, truly can't afford that low cost spay neuter, get it free based on the other people paying for it. Um, so it's kind of, and this shows where my really strong liberal views come from. It's basically rich people paying for poor people. And that's what it is, but you know what, I'm a liberal and so I'm very happy for that. So let the rich pay for the poor. And the program pays for itself, it really does. It, it pays for itself and we make a shit ton of money. We make a ton of money off this program and we're getting animals spayed and neutered. So here's how it works. What we do basically is we provide access to high quality, low cost spay and neuter services to everybody who lives in Santa Cruz County. We offer it to dogs, cats, and rabbits. Those are the three animals that we provide this service to. I didn't realize I made the slide, sorry, it took me <laughs> that one took me by surprise. Um, so basically the Plant Pet Hood program, it assists Santa Cruz County residents with population control costs. Uh, it reduces the number of animals in need, and we do it with our shelter veterinarian and contract veterinarian. So basically all the services are provided either at our main, at our main clinic in Santa Cruz, at our animal shelter, or at that um, clinic in Watsonville, where, as, as I mentioned, the friends group requested it to us. Um, so we have, one of those staffed every single day of the week. Uh, the, main, the main shelter, I believe, is, is staffed five to six days, whereas the one down in Watsonville is only staffed two days a week. We do have an on-staff veterinarian who works for the county, so she works 
five days a week, and then we contract out with other vets, um, two other vets that help us out a uh, couple days a week. So the way we make money off this and the way we do this is, um, and I'll give a shout out to our shelter manager, Ben Winkleblack, who was able to figure all this out. He's very good with statistics and numbers, and he was able to figure this particular part out. Basically, we take the average cost of supplies and material with the veterinarian salary. So we say, okay, so the veterinarian salary is X, Y, Z, the amount it costs to use the anesthesia, the amount it costs to use the, the scalpel, you know, all that stuff. We average all that together, and that's what we charge you for a spay-neuter. So we break even on that. So we charge you 100 bucks for spay-neuter of a dog, and we just break even. We don't make any, any money off just doing the spay-neuter. The way we make money is we then charge, we require these additional services. We say, you know what, if you want to use this program, you have to follow, you have to follow these, these, you have to pay for these services because one, these are required by law. These three things, the rabies vaccination, dog license, and microchip are all required by law in Santa Cruz County. So you can't come use this service unless you abide by the law and pay for these other services. Now granted, if someone comes in and their animal's already vaccinated for rabies, or already microchipped, we're not gonna double dip them. We're gonna say, okay, this particular dog just needs a microchip and just needs a dog license, or this cat just needs a rabies shot. Um, and I should backtrack, rabies vaccinations are not le re legally required in, for cats in California, but we don't tell people that. We tell them they have to do it, so. So here's what, here's what we did when we averaged that out. When we figured out what it costs, it costs us 100 bucks a dog. Ma uh, male or female costs us 100 bucks a spare or neuter dog. Costs us 50 bucks to do a rabbit, I mean a cat, and 75 bucks to do a rabbit. So again, that's what we charge people for the spay neuter services. And that's, granted, 100 bucks is a lot of money for someone who can't afford it, but again, this, this program offers those free to those people, and I'll talk about that in a second. But this 100 bucks, for someone like me who makes, you know, middle income, 100 bucks is a lot better than 500 bucks. And I'm very happy to spend 100 bucks as opposed to 500 bucks to get my animal fixed. So we do, do require some additional expenses. Um, these are things that are not covered by that 100 bucks, just in case uh, to make sure we don't lose money on it. Animals over 100 pounds are an additional 20 bucks. I don't know why that is, but I'm sure the veterinarian could probably answer that at some point. Um, animals in heat are another 20 bucks. Pregnant animals are also an additional 20 bucks. Um, if you're a crypt orchid, it's 20 bucks, and everybody knows what that is. You have one ball instead of two? You still have two, just one doesn't work? It just stuck up there somewhere? Okay. And I will, I, you know, I will stand up here and admit to you that I, I talk all this big talk about spay neuter, right? Well, I'm actually neutered myself. So I'm not just, I'm, I, I have, have gotten a vasectomy. I will never make a human being because I think we're overpopulated with human beings as well. So I practice what I preach. And then the blood panel for animals over seven years of age is 55 bucks. And that's more to make sure that they're okay to go under the anesthesia. So then here's where we charge for the additional services. So here's where the money starts making coming in. So policymakers, here's where you pay attention. Here's where you photograph. Here's how you start making money to pay for other services in your community. So, and, and actually, um, I needed to update. Oh, no, I did update this slide. So the microchip ID, we used to charge $25 for our microchip, and we used to charge $25. Bucks. Um, but then we went to a new service, uh, Found Animals. And I don't know if they sell in Australia, but I will plug them here. Foundanimals.org is an amazing organization. It's a nonprofit organization that sells microchips and does some other stuff. They will sell you their microchip for $5 a piece, which is huge. I mean, that's very low cost. Um, so we used to charge 25 bucks in order to try and recoup some of our costs, but once we went to Found Animals, we lowered that price down to 15 bucks um, just to, to try and get more animals microchipped in the community. Licensing for altered dogs is $29. And then rabies vaccination for dogs and cats, we charge $10. We don't rabies vaccinate the rabbits, and I'm not sure why, but we don't. So we don't, maybe, you know. But I know under California law, they say lagomorphs don't need to be quarantined if they bite, but we did have a, a rabies-positive rabbit in Santa Cruz County about 10 years ago, so I don't know. The actual cost of all this stuff, the microchip, again, again is $5. So there's 10 buck profit right there per animal. Um, plus, I put in there the immediate return if ever impounded, because officers, I hope you have microchip scanners in your trucks. I mean, fabulous, they're all shaking their heads, yes. So you pick up that animal, you scan it for microchip, boom, it's got a microchip, bring that animal home. Do not bring that animal to the shelter, bring the animal home. Unless it's been impounded about 77 times, then maybe you need, if, no, if nobody's home, you need to talk to them. But you know, that's, that's that immediate return if the animal has a microchip. The license, full profit. You know, we make a full $29 off of every dog. 
that, that goes through this program. That's a full profit that comes in, you know, because it takes us about two minutes to data entry the information. It really doesn't take much staff time at all. And then the rabies vaccination costs us $2, and we charge people 10 bucks. We're making 8 bucks off each of those rabies vaccinations. So here's what we make on each dog. 15 bucks minus 5 is what it costs us, so we make $10 profit off each dog. License, that full $29 profit. And again, with the microchip and the license, both of those are immediate returns if we pick them up. You know, if an officer picks up a dog with a, with a, a license tag on and we run the license, we know where it lives, boom, the dog's going home. It's not coming to the shelter. Rabies vaccination, again, 10 bucks. We only, uh, only cost us two, so it's $8. So for dogs who require all those services, we're making 47 bucks per dog. And we do about 10 dogs a day in our clinics. So that's about 470 bucks a day that we're making. Granted, some of this might fall off if the animal's already rabies vaccinated, already microchipped, but you know, you kind of have the hit or, hit or miss here and there. So cats and rabbits, same thing. Cats who get the microchip and the rabies, we get an $18 profit per animal. Rabbits, we get a $10 profit per animal, which isn't really that much for a rabbit, but what is it they say about rabbits? Right? I don't need to say gangbanger around rabbits, but... Um, that's what happens. Rabbits make lots more rabbits. And so even if we lost money on rabbits, we wouldn't care. We just want to get them fixed. Now, we do have the Fix a Pit and Chihuahua program because approximately 33% of the dogs that enter our shelter are either pipples or chihuahuas. Um, so we have a lot of pipples and a lot of chihuahuas in our community. And so we said, you know what? We just want to offer all those guys can be fixed for 50 bucks. We're not going the 100, we're doing 50, we're losing money off of them, but we're getting them fixed. It's gonna help us out in the long run so we don't have more trials and pitbulls coming in. Um, and this is breed-specific legislation. We're vehemently opposed to breed-specific legislation because how do you determine who's a pit bull and who's a chihuahua? Like, how do you truly perform that? But in this thing, it works for us because even if you look like a pit bull or chihuahua, you're getting 50 bucks. And I've, I've had people say to me, well, no, my dog's a boxer. And I go, no, he's not. He's a pit bull boxer. No, no, he's a boxer. No, he's not. He's a pit bull boxer, and they're looking at me, I went, $50. And they go, oh, yes, he's a pit bull boxer. <laughs> and, then, and then as soon as they're done getting the fix, you can go, you have a boxer. <laughs> so we do lose 50 bucks per animal, but it does save money in the long run by having this done. So our main clinic, which is located within our animal shelter, is open seven days a week. We have that staffed Monday through Sunday, seven days a week, and our shelter is open seven days a week. Um, and we have a veterinarian there every single day whether it's our paid for veterinarian who works for the county or one of it's our contract veterinarians, someone's there seven days a week. Now, not only do they work with this Planned Pethood program, so basically the Planned Pethood program offers up 10 spots a day. So we offer 10 spots a day to the community to come in um, and use the Planned Pethood program as we sign things up. And there's so much need for this program that we're actually, what month are we in? September? October? I've lost track of time. I've been here for 30 days. So we're in September, right? September, yes. So when I left, I left in August. We were actually booked out until December. So, you know, we, that's 10 animals a day, seven days a week. We're fully booked out till December right now. That's a lot of animals that are getting fixed in our clinic. So not only do we do those 10 per day of the Planned Pethood program, though, we also do the spay and neuter of the shelter animals. So the animals that come in, get temperament tested, are going to go up for adoption, need to be spayed and neutered. So our veterinarian who's working on staff does that as well. And then uh, the staff veterinarian also provides emergency and basic medical care to shelter animals. So an officer picks up a hit-by-car dog or a sick cat. We bring that animal in. We don't have to pay an outside veterinarian to take a look at that animal. Our veterinarian will look at that animal and provide the necessary uh, care for that animal while it's there, whether it's immediate emergency care or whether it's just something ongoing chronic. Our veterinarian can care for that animal, so we're not paying for an outside vet. Um, and then again, the animal cruelty and neglect investigations. And this is, I don't think John's in the room, but... I thank John because he fully trained our vet. Our vet used to work for the city of San Jose, um, and he trained her in veterinary forensics and trained her in animal cruelty investigations, and then she left him and came to us. So we thank him very much for all that uh, training he provided her because she's fabulous. Um, we had a, a dog shooting case a, a, about a year ago now um, where the, the guy's poodle, no, the guy's Rottweiler, I forget how it happened now. Well, one of his dogs told him to kill the other dog. So he decided, based on the one dog telling him to kill the other dog, he shot the dog in the head. And then he goes, wait a minute. The dog he just shot goes, you're a bastard. I can't believe you just killed me. Kill the other dog. I can't believe the other dog told you to do that. So he takes the other dog, and he puts him in a stove, and he lights him on fire. So obviously that's not someone I'm going to educate, right? That's someone who we're going to prosecute. So we get those animals in, and our veterinarian, who's fully trained in this stuff, you know, she's, she's fucking kick-ass. Have you guys ever watched the show Dexter? 
Yeah, Dexter, the blood splatter guy, when he walks in the room, he's got, like, the bl things pointing everywhere and, like, the blood trajectory. That's what she did. She came out, and she's, like, putting these little things up, and she's, you know, I felt, I felt really cool. I was like, shit, I'm, like, a crime scene investigator right now. This is fucking cool, you know, so. But that's what she does, and if, if, if I would encourage any vet out there that doesn't have that training to do it because she then goes into, when we go into court to testify on this stuff, I can go in and say, you know, as an officer, based on my training experience, you know, shooting a dog and burning a dog really is not good. I can say all that, but then she can come in and say, based on my necropsy, based on my investigation, this dog died by result of a gunshot to the head, which is obvious, right? It's obvious he shot the dog to the head, but in court, you need to convince beyond a reasonable doubt. So you have an expert coming in saying, based on my training experience and based on the necropsy I performed, this dog was shot and killed in the head and this dog was burned alive, and she can, she can figure that out based on the necropsy, I don't know how it works, but apparently you can cut them open, look at their organs and all that stuff, and you can figure out whether they were burned alive or burned after being killed. So that's the kind of stuff she can come in, and, and I'm kind of going off topic here, but it's fabulous. So <laughs> if you're a veterinarian, get trained in this stuff because it's fabulous. You know, and, and the guy ended up getting um, a longer time in jail because based on her testimony, um, she was able to say that the dog was burned alive as opposed to you know, being burned dead. Because I get there, and I look at it, and I'm like, yep, that dog's dead, and it's burned. You know, so... Completely off topic, but there you have it. So again, the, the clinic down in Watsonville, um, it follows the planned pet hood model that I've been talking about. Um, it's only open two days, I think it's a two days a week, right? but the, yeah, it's open two days a week, um, and that's either staffed uh, by our shelter veterinarian or one of those folks that we contract with. And this is where we truly provide access to the underserved. This is the woman whose two cats were on the train track. I was able to get those guys fixed so quick because this is operating down in that community. As opposed to having to drive 50 miles, what would that be, about 80 kilometers? Instead of having to drive 80 kilometers to the other shelter, I can then drive five kilometers to this, this particular place, get them fixed, and bring them right back in. So we have that in that underserved community so we can, boom, just work right then and there. Um, and it also assists with emergency medical care of the shelter animals. And this is where my granny squad comes in. So my granny squad works the two days that this clinic is open. So I think it's Wednesdays and Thursdays, they go out there and they work those particular days. So when they're talking to someone, someone goes, yeah, you know what? I do want to spay neuter my animal. They grab that animal, they throw it in their truck, they drive it over here and get it fixed and then bring it back. Before that person has time to think, wait, you know, I don't, I don't want to do that anymore. So we get them in that day so that it gets done. And then the animal control officers usually utilize that clinic uh, a lot when it's open. So the revenue. Here's the part you've all been waiting for. What kind of revenue? And this, this excludes dog licensing. So remember, that's $29 per dog in dog licensing, so even more revenue based on this. So we started this program in 2011. Started in the middle of the year, we made $17,480 off of it. In 2012, made close to $90,000 in direct revenue. 2013, $91,000. 2014, $106,000. Now that's a shit ton of money. That a, that, that's more than I make a year. They were bringing in. So they're basically paying my salary and some. And not only were we making all that money, think of if you start kind of dividing all that money up by saying, okay, $10 for a rabies shot, or even if you just divide it by the 100 bucks per dog, that's that many animals getting spayed and neutered. So we've, we've spayed and neutered that many animals and made that money. It's pretty cool. So where does this revenue go? What do we do with all this money that we make? Well, this is when we give those truly underserved people free spay and neuters. This is when we give that woman who's living under the railroad tracks free spay and neuter for her two cats. This is when I go to the homeless shelter and someone's there with their truly loved animal that they can't afford the spay and neuter, I'll spay and neuter that animal for free. And it's great, you know, the number of times, and my officer is Officer Montez, who I showed yesterday, my six foot five, 450 pound big dude. Um, his nickname's Teddy, by the way. Um, he's, he's like a big teddy bear. He looks tough, but he's, he's one of the nicest guys you'll know, but he's very law enforcement minded. He's always been like, I wanna enforce the law, I wanna enforce the law. Um, and now that we have all this extra money to do this stuff, he suddenly realized, well, wait a minute, you know, just the other day he called me, and he goes, Todd, you know, I'm out at this call, and this woman's got these three dogs, and I've been trying to work with her and trying to get them fixed, and she finally today told me just to take them, and, and I don't want to take them. Can we get them done for free? I said, yes, Teddy, yes, you can, and that, you know, that's, that's, that's what this is for, is to keep those animals in the home, and to even get big old Officer Montez, who's Mr. Law Enforcement, Mr. I want to throw everybody in jail and give them a ticket to say, you know what? And it's not worth it bringing this woman's dogs into, into custody. Let's keep them in the house. So, you know, that's we, we spend a lot of money on free spay and neuter services. Um, also allows us to lower cost of other services. As I said, our market chips used to be 25 bucks a pop. Now we've lowered them down to 15. Because we have this extra money, we don't need to make the extra money off the microchips. So now we're providing services to the community at a lower price. 
we're now providing microchips to the community at 15 bucks. And personally, in my mind, if I were a general manager, microchips would be free, but, and that'd be free to everybody. Um, I'm one of those people, I'm a government official, but I hate the government. Um, I think that laws were made to be broken. <clears throat> um, <laughs> but, and, and so there is a law that all dogs and cats need to be microchipped in Santa Cruz County. So in my mind, the government should offer those services for free. I'm not God, nor am I the general manager. So for now, they're, they're $15. But it also allows us to reduce fees or fines on underserved individuals who are good owners. So um, let me think of a case in point example. Wow, I can't think of one. We have no good owners in Santa Cruz. No, but this is for, this is for the folks, um, oh, here's a good, the, the folks who are arrested for doing something dumb. So the gentleman who gets really drunk and pisses on the side of a building in the middle of the night and a cop sees him doing it, the cop arrests him and he's got a dog with him and the dog comes into the shelter. So he did something really stupid. He got drunk and he pissed on the side of the building. And so, yes, he went to jail. Yes, he's got to pay a fine for that. But should he not be given his animal back because he can't afford to get the animal out? Um, you know, because we charge, we charge impound fees if an animal comes in, protective custody. So someone like that who truly can't afford to get the animal back out, we will cover those fees based on this so that they don't have to worry about it and they can get that animal back. Um, the really shitty people, like the guy who shot his Rottweiler to death, um, you know, if he came in to get another animal out and he couldn't afford it, that's when we go, yes, he can't afford it. He can't get it out. We're not going to help him out, but we're going to help those people who truly need it and are truly good owners to get those animals out at no cost. So some shelter statistics, and I should have put these in some of the other slides, but as you can see, um, and, and, and I don't know why that euthanasia number is so I think I, I honestly think I screwed up. Here's another one of my mistakes. I think the stray and the euthanasia should actually be different. <laughs> so instead of blue being stray, blue is euthanasia and gray is stray. All right, so just reverse those and that's, you can just see though the trend and whether that's because of the Planned Parenthood program, whether that's because of community outreach, whether that's because of Officer Montes giving out free spay noodles, whatever that is, whatever's happening in Santa Cruz, something's working. Numbers are going down. And then this is Watsonville specific. Uh, this is the number of stray dogs and stray cats that are coming in. Um, and, and I know there's been a lot of talk about um, not taking cats in. Uh, my, I, I'm for it. My boss is not. So in Santa Cruz County, we will take in all cats no matter what. Um, I, have, I have no say over that, so that's what happens. But even with that, where we'll take in every single cat, um, no questions asked, our stray cat numbers are even going down, which I think has a lot to do with the spay-neuter. And particularly, I think it has a lot to do with bringing that clinic directly into the community. Because um, the numbers are, if, if you look in 2011, 2012, 2013, those stray cats, it's kind of being the same. But then 2014, boom, it starts dropping. And I think that's a direct correlation to that Planned Pedhood program being put, boom, smack dab in the community. So I think that, again, it's hard with statistics as you don't really know, as John says, what the cause and effect is and why this happened. You know, I, I don't study that directly, but that's just the numbers. And looking at that, I, you know, that would be my assumption based on that. And I'm done. I've cursed enough in Australia. So questions, questions, questions. So many questions for Cindy and Todd. And I think we're cracking off over here. If we've got a microphone, where are our lovely... <laughs> Micah, the microphone lady. So... Uh, over here first, maybe. Uh, this is directed for Cindy. Um, why aren't more resources put into building up an extensive foster care networks as a way of keeping animals out of shelter? Um. It, that can be something to do as a foster care network, but I would really encourage any shelter as they're starting to put together a foster care network is to figure out why. If it's simply to give your shelter more capacity, I would look at that because you still have to find outcomes for all those animals, right? So I, 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 I don't like to encourage shelters to just create like, just make themselves bigger if they don't still then have an outcome for it. But that being said, that's a great time for adoption ambassadors, right? So if the animals never have to come back to the shelter, if they can just go to foster and then go out, that's great. 
Um, I think foster programs are great to help animals that don't do well in the shelter or uh, if they need long-term medical care. But to have a foster system simply to give you bigger capacity needs to be looked at because you still have to care for all those, right? Foster programs also are very, very, very resource intensive. So if you can do that, that's great, but those are still animals that are in the care of the shelter. So if the shelter can support it, absolutely. But I think it's still then you need to count that within your capacity. Does that make sense? Like you still have to find outcomes for them, you still have to provide care. So it can work sometimes, but a lot of times, a lot of shelters find, well, that still, just by putting them into foster, puts us over our capacity for care. Okay. Thank you. Yes? Uh, my question's for you, Todd. Um, do you have any problems with other um, shelter and organisations taking advantage of the free um, spay or neuter um, programs that you run um, and then adopting those animals? So you mean like, an, like a rescue group would utilize our services or? Yeah. Um, we, 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 the only animals that we will do provide the free spay neuter services for, we'll actually um, usually charge the rescue groups for it is the, the feral cat folks. So the feral cat folks, we do all those services for free. Um, we, we, we microchip them, we spay neuter them, we do all that for them. Um, but as far as if they're gonna come in, if it's like a breed specific rescue that says, I want that German Shepherd, um, it's, um, I'm pretty sure we charge them for it. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we provide it free to the rescue. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we're allowed to, but we do. <laughs> 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 no one's complained yet, so. Um, but even if some people took advantage of it, I mean, it's not gonna happen every single day, but if it happens once or twice and someone takes advantage of this, people take advantage of the system every day, based on the amount of extra revenue we have, it's not the end of the world, you know. Okay, and over here next. Hi, um, question to anyone who can help. Um, how do you go about encouraging or convincing people from non-English speaking backgrounds to be open to their male cats being desexed? We've encountered some resistance from people. They're happy to get their female cats desexed, but not their male cats. In some cases, they're quite proud of the cat's testicles and don't want the testicles removed. I've looked into the cost of vasectomies. It's out of the question. Um, that, do you have any suggestions? That is, uh, that is one of the hardest things is the macho guys in the balls. They hate to give them up. Um, and that, for me, that's where I kind of always come in with, you know, I'll, I'll act all manly. I'm, I'm not a very manly guy. I might look it on some level, but I'm not really all that tough. I pretend to be sometimes. Um, but I will try to pretend I'm tough with those guys. And then when we're kind of doing the macho thing and posturing back and forth, I say, by the way, I'm neutered. You know, and then they go, oh. And then we kind of, kind of, it jokes, it makes it human, and we kind of start talking about it how just by chopping the dog or the cat or the dog's testicles off doesn't make that cat any less of a cat. Um, that's where I'm lucky in doing it because I have kind of have that story to use. Um, do you want to? <laughs> I, know, I was gonna say, so I don't have that. Um, <coughs> what a, what, um, I was working at a community clinic and um, a gentleman came up and, and I said, oh, is your dog spayed? No. I said, okay, I let it go. I came back to him and I was like, you know, um, do you know the, the medical benefits of her being spayed? And he's like, no, and I told him. And it really came down to the fact that he was just tired of people telling him what to do. So I let it become his decision to make the right choice for his dog. He wasn't doing it because I had asked him to, he did it because he'd come to the conclusion that it was best for his animal. So I always approach it from a medical standpoint and all the benefits to the animal. Well, and then I don't know why anyone would wanna live with an intact cat, that's disgusting. Um, especially a male, but um, when you can speak to them about all the things that how it actually benefits the animal, then hopefully they'll come to that conclusion themselves. Um, so that's and the way I usually... if that hasn't worked? Uh, what's that? If that hasn't worked, you've tried that and that hasn't worked? Oh, it's been very successful. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just to throw another plug in for the Pets for Life uh, program guide that I think most of us have mentioned, there's actually a whole chapter on spay-neuter conversations and there's... Uh, specifically questions directed at that, how to, how to work with people who are macho and don't want to get the animal fixed, how to convince them over time. And the thing to always remember is even if you don't convince them that day, it doesn't mean they're never going to do it. Um, but if you're kind of like that squeaky wheel that keeps going out and you build the trust, and that's a lot of what it is too, is sometimes they just think you're some crazy, you know, um, ball hunter. They're just like, this, this crazy, this person's just out looking for balls all over the community. I'm not giving them up. But if you constantly go out and constantly win their trust and they get to engage with you and know who you are, 
they're going to realize you're a human as well and you're not just trying to get the nuts because you want to add it to the tally on the board, that you're doing it for a reason. So. Yeah, that's, um, that's a big thing with Pets for Life is the, the conversation doesn't start with, can I have the balls? It starts with, what can we do to help you? And then, yeah, you build the trust, you start to have the relationship, and then you, you move into it. Okay, thank you. And over here. I just had um, actually one for Cynthia and, and one for Todd. So Cynthia, uh, I attended your uh, talk, full day talk on Tuesday and, and you know we were all just incredibly impressed. I know you're going down to Victoria on Monday, Tuesday, so I was just wondering whether you could perhaps, and, and I think you're giving some talks down there, so I was just wondering if you could perhaps, you or Nell could let the people in the room know where you're doing that in case people here have people in Victoria that they'd like to hear you speak because I think it's it would be really important to get your messages out to as many people as possible. A and just for Todd, just so I can get my head around what you're saying with the Planned Parenthood, the $100,000 does or doesn't account for the costs of the vets and vet nurses and anesthesia, et cetera, or is it over and above? That's, that's direct revenue. So that's profit. That's direct profit, I'm sorry. So it's after the costs of, of yes. the vets? And, yeah, okay. Yes, right. yes. I have a question for you, Todd. Um, some of the statistics you put up there, I think I got this right, you were saying that your uh, facility was uh, neutering, desexing 10 animals a day, that was your, your booking limit, mm -hmm. the way through to December. And then in addition to that, there were medical cases coming in and other um, neutering uh, situations from your shelter. Is this is one veterinarian doing all that surgery one day? Yes. Whoa. Um, there, there's That's a nice program, work. and I'm not sure Betsy might know, but I, I believe it's in North Carolina. <laughs> Humane Alliance. There, there's an organization called Humane Alliance in North Carolina that actually specifically trains veterinarians how to do high quality, basically factory line spay neuter, just boom, 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 how yeah. to do it, but do it effectively and, and um, okay. you know, high quality. Fantastic. So, and she was trained there. So. Brilliant. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Gleason. More questions. Oh, everybody, go, Lisa. <laughs> You stole part of my question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but the second part of my question is, how did you communicate with the other vet clinics in the area? My boss is from Chicago. Um, anybody know about Chicago and the gangsters and the, Chicago's known for being very tough and very like, I'm gonna you know, kick ass. So basically my boss don't give a shit. My boss is, is very brash, very, I mean, she's a wonderful person, but she does not care. And if she had vets that disliked her, she didn't care because she wanted to get the spay neuter done. On the flip side, and this is always the question we get regarding everything we do, is the folks that work, well, maybe not with the Planned Pethood, but with all the other services, we're not taking away their customers with a lot of the low-cost stuff we do or the free stuff we do because those folks aren't actually going to the vet in the first place. Um, so those folks are not really being affected. Um, and, and there's still people that are going out paying four or 500 bucks for the spay neuter surgeries because they don't know about us. Um, but I think in all honesty, it's because my, my boss is from Chicago and she's a gangster, so. <laughs> if I, if I could case. be slightly more politically. Um, uh, it, it's become a big thing um, of, because the, it's becoming more popular to have low cost services in places because people need them. Um, and I heard a really great talk uh, by Dr. Scarlett. She's a, one of the co-presidents of the San Francisco SPCA and she said, you know, the Macy's, you know, it's a high-end store in the States, does not get upset when a Goodwill, the consignment store, comes into the neighborhood. Why? Because they're serving different populations, right? We're talking apples and oranges. And Todd's exactly right. The, the communities that there's, the, most of the folks they're serving are never gonna be able to afford or be able to go to the other veterinarians. And so it really does become us as veterinarians coming together and saying, you know, it takes two, it takes everyone to serve both and to not be getting upset. And instead, I try and engage those veterinarians and be like, well, then come help us. Okay. Russell. And I, I just wanted to add to that point. Um, when we talk about vets not being happy, let's, let's be honest, we're talking about vet practice owners because we're still employing vets to do the surgery. So that's quite different and most, yeah, so at the end of the day, we're, we're talking about a very small percentage of people that are actually business owners that aren't happy with it, and that's just because of a different business model. So I think what you say is, is right. Mm. Um, and did you, to get back to, I don't know where I'm speaking on Monday. 
Uh, well, you, you're actually. I mean, I know. You're I know actually I'm actually speaking to... at Russell's facility. Oh, yeah. you're, you guys are organising. I know. It, aren't you? I know that I'm flying to Melbourne on Sunday. Yeah. Lord, <laughs> Lord Smith is organising it. Is that correct? <laughs> okay, here's the microphone. It's, it's at um, 6.30 at the um, National Australia Bank, NAB headquarters um, in Docklands. Um, it's free. Um, and it's, it will be covering really what Cynthia's talked about today and on um, Wednesday. But we would encourage people that have got colleagues that haven't been able to make it up here to, to come. And um, if you're interested, find me and I'll give you the link to RSVP. And, and I'll try and add in some new fun things. <laughs> Just to throw out there too, I did a webinar for the ASPCA about a year or two ago and it's free. So if you go to the ASPCA's, um, I think it's called ASPCA Professional, um, and you look up Proactive Community Animal Control or just maybe Google my name, you'll find it on there and it's free. It's like an hour and a half. Have you told these guys about your great pseudo putting human back in humane that you did? Oh, that's correct. Um, that's up too. Yeah, th there's also, if you go to animalsheltering.org, um, there's a, a I think it's actually the front front of the page right now, right? Putting humane human back in humane. Yeah. So if you go to the front page of animalsheltering.org, there's a little click, and I think you just see my head sitting there. It's actually kind of embarrassing. So <laughs> thank you, Betsy, for just having my head sitting there. But if you click on my head, um, you'll also see me talk there. So it's a great it's a great cause. There's other there's a couple of people involved in each each one of these events. So okay, thank you. And over here, just and a I silly question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> We have a real small dog shortage. Can we have all your chihuahuas? Yes. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> we will work together. You don't want to think about that for a while, Todd? No? If, and, and, and I don't, what is the quarantine procedure here? Like, it's about three months, uh, yeah. I think. Three, three months? Three months. Ten days what? of these rabies. They've changed it? Yeah, send them over. Just uh, ask Johnny Depp. Well, he knows all about that. Yeah. I mean, if, if we can figure out some way to put them on a plane and ship them, we're happy to do it. Because <laughs> Yeah, take the staffies in exchange. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, more questions. Are we over here? Yes. Sorry, that's just a response to your last comment. We've got a massive um, oversupply of short dogs in Queensland, Rockhampton. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'd like to get in contact with you. Sorry, you do, could you just say that again? It's like we've got too many small dogs. Ah, okay. Um, where we are, so, yeah. We can get in contact with you. Right. <laughs> Rockhampton? Any more questions? Yes. Just about the private vet, vets thing. Um, Jeff Young, the early age desexing person, a vet from the US, he spoke a couple of times ago at G2Z and he spoke about the fact that a private vet clinic can operate as a for-profit vet clinic but also have rehoming component and so forth. Uh, I think quite a lot of vets are doing it and certainly in WA we've got a couple of vets who run low-cost desexing for members of their community and it's completely unrelated to any shelter or any rescue yep. or any anything else except it's off their own bat entirely and the rehoming. Um, I wanted to say about foster caring as well, that's a, a really prime source of adoptions as well since so many foster carers take on the adoptions. I also wanted to say that um, the, the vet services that you provide, cheat, spray and neuter, I think we should be providing those to the rescues and other groups as well, which is something that Cat Haven does in WA when we can, $97 SNP chip and first vaccination for rescues, which helps them, in turn helps us all. Yep. Yeah, no, that's becoming a bigger model in the States too, is for-profit clinics are opening a non-for-profit arm. And so, um, and then they have programs called like Spay It Forward, so the people who can pay more do pay more, and then they, you know, they can basically pay to have someone else's surgery covered. Um, yes, I did not mean to poo-poo foster programs. <laughs> that could be a whole Sorry, talk on its own. <laughs> I think they're fabulous, but I think a lot of shelters take them on without proper planning, and they get completely overrun. But absolutely, to me, the most successful foster programs are the ones where the animals go out and they never come back. So let your in, empower your fosters to be the adoption ambassador. Like let them do everything. Let them find the adopter. Let them take the animal out and about. Um, absolutely. Because a lot of people, the reason I love, well, there's lots of reasons I love it, but lots of people don't want to come into a shelter um, because they don't understand sheltering. They find it very sad. Um, 
or they think all the animals are defective, but when they can see the animal out in the community doing things, then they'll adopt them. So I'm all for having animals everywhere, like not just in pet stores, but like, you know, have adoptions outside Starbucks or something, you know, where people are, take the animals to them. So absolutely. Okay, any more questions? The Sandy and Flower, no? Okay, well, will you please say thank you very much to them both for... Uh, <laughs>